Good morning, Coastway Church. Hey, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship our King, King Jesus. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came. And he died, and he rose, those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God. King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. And now those altars in the well. Tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. He did, he did Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Him This is our God This is who He is He loves us This is our God This is what He does He saves us He bore the cross He beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, he beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Praise God. He is our God. Well, welcome, Coastway Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if this is your first time here, uh, we're, we're just so glad that you are here. And um, if you didn't already get a gift from the welcome tent when you came in, make sure when you leave, you pick that up. And we'd love to connect with you there and hear your story. Uh, we're about to sing Waymaker. It's, uh, it's a great song. It reminds us of who God is. What he does, even in that last song, uh, it said, this is who our God is, this is what he does. And I was thinking uh, this week how often um, I consider my way of thinking and my ways uh, better than God's way, which is crazy when, when you say that out loud. But um, whether that's not praying as I ought to, 
uh, even sin, you're thinking that your way is uh, better than God's way. Um, but thankfully, God gives us Holy Scripture to remind us how little that we actually know and how infinite and wise God is. And in Isaiah 55, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So as you sing, remember that you are limited, but God has no limits, and there's nothing that God can't do. And if creating the universe and giving you life and breath wasn't enough, God makes a promise to save us from sin, death, and hell. He gives us a way, and Jesus, he is the way. So let's keep singing to our God who makes a way. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, bending every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work. And you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. We make a miracle work. Promise keep the light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are.
Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you today. We just ask you to humble our hearts before you, Lord, and remove everything in us, God, that keeps us from hearing your voice today. I just ask you to come and prepare us for what we're uh, fixing to hear, Lord, and just do the work that only you can do in our hearts, Father God. We humble ourselves before you now, and we thank you, Father, for the precious blood of Jesus Christ your son that gave his all so that we could have the hope of heaven. Thank you, Father God, for these promises. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated and take a look at your screens. Happy Sunday, Coastway Church. It is great to see you. 
I want to start by uh, celebrating and also with a shout out. I want to celebrate something that we do from time to time to help uh, men, women, and children take next steps of faith in their walk with Jesus. It is an event, an environment that we call the Weekender. And we, sell, we had the, hosted the Weekender a couple weeks ago, and we had 16 of you, 16 uh, people who showed up to hear what, what would it look like for me to go from just curious about Coastway, curious about discipleship, to connected to vehicles for discipleship and environments for discipleship. So we call it going from curious to connected. And we saw 16 do that over dinner, hearing how they could make a difference uh, for Jesus. And it was an incredible time. And uh, here's what we hope will happen is it, over the course of the weekend, or we just hope that those who, who join us would understand and leave with a clear sense of what does it look like to live from my God-given identity, the way that God created me to live and relate. And how do I do that in community? And how do I do that on mission according to God's great purpose? And when folks go through the weekender and they say, hey, I want to do that with Coastway, we call that commissioned membership. Commissioned means committed to the mission. Membership means I'm a part of a local church family. We deeply believe that these are biblical ideas and we want to offer them uh, through the weekender. So we're, we're super excited about that. I also want to uh, give a big shout out and show honor to our veterans and veteran spouses as Veterans Day uh, weekend is here. And I think whenever I think about our military personnel and those who have sacrificed so much for us to enjoy justice, order, and, and peace, I think about how that points to a greater sacrifice, yeah, the sacrifice of Jesus. At the heart of the gospel is one who get, laid down his life for others. And as Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, then he laid down his life for his friends. And we see that and we honor that in our, uh, with our veterans. And so here's where we're at. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to James chapter 5, as many of you know, we are walking through the book of James, and we've been going verse by verse. We've been going line uh, by line. There's a bit of a plot twist today that I want to uh, introduce uh, with, and that is that instead of finishing James chapter 5 by going from front to back, starting with James 5 verse 1, we're actually going to go from back to front and finish uh, in a different order. We're not going to miss anything. We're still going to cover all those passages. But uh, the reason why we're doing this, um, there was a theologian by the name of John Stott. And he said that uh, as a pastor, uh, so much of your calling and commitment is to keep uh, an ear to the Word of God and an ear to the world around you. It's, it's an ear to the text of Scripture and an ear to the context of what is going on in everyday life. And when you put those together, it's what you would call a word in season. It's a word for today. When what's happening, what's being said in the word uh, aligns with what happens in the world. And that's really what we're all looking for. The reason why, you know, you would come to church one time to see whether or not it's going to be something that's actually going to apply to your life and be meaningful and, and real and clear, but you would come back to a church because it is. And so today, what we're looking for and what we want to offer is a word that speaks to what's really going on in, uh, in a, not just in the world, but out there, but in the world in here. And that's why this faith IRL uh, teaching is in place, faith in real life. And so as I've kept an ear to the heart of our church the past few weeks, as I've been sitting in community groups, as um, I, I preached a very difficult funeral a couple of weeks ago, as I've been exchanging lots of texts and phone calls with, with many of you, it's very apparent that uh, some of you are, are suffering in some, some very significant ways. You're waking up with chronic pain, some illness, some injury. Uh, others are caught up in some pattern of sin that's really, really hard uh, to, to break. Uh, others of you, you just feel defeated. Uh, you've lost joy. You've lost confidence. You've, you've lost hope. And if that's not you, then rest assured that's someone who is close to you. And knowing that, James 5, 1 through 6, which is real life finances, did not feel as fitting for today. We're going to cover that actually at the end on November 26th. Um, but today our church needs prayer. And so we're going to exercise some freedom within the fence line of James chapter 5, and we're going to work from back to front instead of front 
to back. And so here we are. Just like last week was a providential word on how do we plan, today I believe there is a providential word on how we pray. And I just want to go ahead and tell you that um, prayer, what is it? It is personal communication with the living God. And our desire today is to turn this place into a house of prayer. There's going to be a moment at the end when we're going to have our care team come forward and you can receive prayer, uh, someone to pray for you, someone to pray with you. You can come forward, you can kneel and pray. But we want to turn this place into a house of prayer today because there's a lot of needs. And we, we want to leave here with more help and with more hope and with more healing than when we first walked in. So James chapter 5, verse 13, pick up with me. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him what? Pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Praise is a type of prayer that is directed to God for the good that he gives. So there's prayer again. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them do what? Pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the what? Prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Verse 17, we, we get an example and a picture of what prayer looks like. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, verse 20, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So clearly, from what James is describing and what James is prescribing, prayer is really important, right? It was um, 2013 when uh, WestJet Airlines out of Canada started to run a TV ad com campaign where they were uh, basically capturing the reactions of their passengers uh, as they were boarding their flight and as they arrived at their destinations. And here's the twist on what was going on. As the passengers were getting onto their flight, it was the Christmas season, and uh, there, was a, there was a screen that would appear where they would scan their boarding pass, and a virtual Santa would appear on the screen and would go, ho, 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 and then, what do you want for Christmas? It would literally ask the passengers, what do you want, what do you want for Christmas? And there was a place where they could type in, what did they want for Christmas? And so some people started you know, typing in different things, depending on the person, and little did they know, they just probably thought that it was a joke, that WestJet Airlines had planted employees in the arrival cities of all of these passengers to go out and shop for what they put down that they wanted in between their departure and arrival. And so not only did, when they come to baggage claim, not only did they get to pick up their bags, but some of them were also met with iPads and widescreen TVs and tablets and golf clubs. And this one poor guy on the commercial, I feel sorry for this guy, he asked for socks and underwear. <laughs> Little did he know what was being offered to him. Wouldn't he have asked for so much more if he had realized what was being offered to him? That's really sad for that guy who ended up just with socks. But it's even sadder because that's the way that we tend to relate to God through prayer is instead of relating to God as if he is able and faithful to give us these big requests, these bold requests, we settle for a pair of socks. And we never really expect him to actually do something significant in our lives. And I would say that the reason we don't receive great things from God has less to do with God's unwillingness to provide and more to do with our failure to ask. As the hymn writer John Newton put it, he wrote Amazing Grace. That's what he's known for. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. 
So what James does right here is he talks about prayer eight times in eight verses, and it's all in the context of real life stuff. So we all face good days and bad days, right? But if we're being honest, it often feels like there's more bad days than there are good days. You ever thought about that? Why is it, why is it that there's, it feels like there's more bad days than good days? Well, there's a, there's a very simple and biblical answer. It's because suffering, because sickness, and because sin never stop. And sometimes it's caused by us. It's something that we do that's, that's foolish or selfish. Other times it's, it's something that's done to us. Someone else does something sinful or selfish or, or foolish. And other times it's just something that we live in a broken, fallen world. It's out of our control. And that's why right in the middle of James chapter 5, verse 16, James mentions our need for healing. So we're going to talk about healing today. Some of you, you, you actually need to be healed on some level. You need to be healed relationally. You need to be healed emotionally. You need to be healed mentally, spiritually, maybe even, maybe even financially. There's some area in your life you're like, you look at that and you say, I, I don't have to look very long. That is not okay. And here's what we believe. Just like you would go to a doctor to get a prescription for something that will heal you, that will make you well again, so do we go to Jesus, who is a great physician, who has a great prescription for help, for hope, and for healing, and it's called prayer. So to give you a way to think about what James just said in these, in these verses is, it's this, it's fervent and faithful prayer is the prescription to every problem. That's what he's saying. Fervent and faithful prayer is the prescription to every problem. So why do we usually have a care team available who comes down front, we'll do this today, after we preach and after we sing to offer prayer? Or why do we send out a prayer guide with the needs within our church and the names of the members of our church? It's because we believe that prayer is powerful. You see, here's what I think about. When man works, man works. But when man prays, God prays. We believe in the power of prayer. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Uh, prayer moves the hand that moves mountains. And if you've got a mountain in front of you that you can't move in your own power, isn't that all of us, by the way? Why not appeal to the great mountain mover who is able and faithful? And that's what prayer is about. But we don't just believe it's powerful. We believe that prayer is personal. I mean, it, prayer just makes sense if you're a child of God. It's like, I love God. He loves me. And he's my father. I'm his child. He wants me around. And prayer is how I draw near. I have a desire, and he has the ability to provide, so why don't I bring him in on it? And he wants to give me good things. I think about Romans 8, 32, where Paul said, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And by all things, he's talking about all things that accord with his good, true, and right purposes. And nobody understands prayer better than kids. And I'll, let me give you an example of this. The way that kids relate to parents, you know, to, to loving, nurturing, present parents, that's the way that we're supposed to relate to God, right? Um, I want to be modest with how I share this, but um, you have young kids, and you're trying to go to the bathroom. And suddenly, out of nowhere, that kid just walks in. Just like, anybody? Okay, uh, don't raise your hand, but um, almost in that moment, you want to look at your kid and be like, what part of this moment makes you feel like I want you involved? <laughs> they don't care, it, because hey, here's the deal. They think that you always want them around you, right? And that they think that you always want to be around them, right? And I think that God is bigger and better than us because he, leg he legitimately always wants us around and the only wrong way to come is to not come to him at all. Kids understand this, don't they? Um, so here's, a, here's about a 30-minute primer. I want, I want to give you a heads up for where we're going. Some of you today, you need to come forward and you need to receive prayer because you're going some, through something really hard. And, and you, need, you need hope, you need help, you need healing in some area. You need to come forward for yourself or you need to come forward for someone else. And I, I just want to uh, give us 
a notice that this is where we want to go. This is what we want to be about. We want our church to be a place where people can have spiritual needs met. And if you think about it, this is actually a pretty good offer because where else can you go and get prayer in Jesus's name? It's like you go to Home Depot. It's like, I'll take the two by fours and the tools and I could really use a word of prayer. It's like, we'll do the two by four, we'll do the tools, but you're out to dry on the prayer, all right? You go to Chipotle and you're like, I want a burrito bowl and some extra pico and some prayer. It's like, I can do the bowl and I can do the the pico, but uh, no dice on the prayer. Then you go to Chick-fil-A, they'll probably pray for you, right? Okay, I mean, it's just, it's Chick-fil-A. That's not exactly what they do. Oh, a little weird, but yeah, that's kind of who we are. So uh, I understand, by the way, I understand that when you take a passage like what we just read, you have a lot of questions. Scholars say that this, by the way, is one of the most complicated passages in the enti- and confusing passages in the entire New Testament. And so... Um, I understand there's probably a lot of questions, and my full-time job is to take God's Word in a way that, is conf- that might be confusing and give it to you in a way that's clear and helpful. And, uh, and I, I, just imagine, just think about it this way. Let's say that at your job, whatever it is that you do, not only are you going to do all those things throughout the week that you do to provide a service or fulfill like a commitment, but then at the end of the week, you're expected to give a 40-minute talk on the significance and the importance of why what you do and why what you offer is helping the world. And, oh, you need to do it to the same group of people every single week because they have heard they heard you last week. Any takers? Right. That's basically what preaching is. And so all, all week what I'm doing is I'm looking. And by the way, anybody can stand up and talk. But to stand up and talk in a way that faithfully represents God, especially in a confusing text like this, that's what I've been doing this week. So let me give you the frame of everything that we just walked through. If you're taking notes, write this down. Real life prayer involves praying through suffering, like saints, and for sinners. That's what James just said in these eight verses. Real life prayer involves praying through suffering like saints and four sinners. So we're going to talk about all those things, and we're going to do those things today. First of all, this, is ver- this comes from verses 13 through 16, this first idea. It's pray through suffering. So verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him what? Pray. So how did James start? James started with the relationship between prayer and suffering, and now James is ending with the relationship between prayer and suffering. And so this is really important. It's like he bookends his entire letter to these, these church people who are scattered and, 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 and suffering. And he says, it, suffering and prayer are inseparably connected. And uh, let me just give you a quick recap. Back to the beginning, here's what he said in James 1, 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials, that sufferings of various kinds. So that's where he started. And so I just want to say, suffering is not a matter of if, but when. And if you have, are not, have not suffered much in your life, it's probably because you're still very young. It's probably because there are a lot of experiences and a lot of exposure that's coming ahead of you in life. Suffering is coming for all of us, for all of you, uh, for, for everyone. It's no respecter of persons. And here's what we know. Um, you're either going into, coming out of, or currently in some experience of suffering. And it comes in from all angles. Uh, James says in James 1, 2, it comes in various kinds. So we talked about the most common categories in week one, but I know some of you weren't here, and we could all use a refresher. So let me give you a quick recap on the kinds and the categories of suffering that comes at us from all angles. First of all, there is spiritual suffering. So spiritual suffering would be persecution. This would be where you are mocked or ridiculed, or uh, attacked socially on some level because of your Christian faith. Uh, There is temptation. That could be a form of spiritual suffering where you're tempted in a way that you continually give in to that temptation and you can't get out from underneath that temptation. That could be a type. Um, Then there's also spiritual attack where the, the devil's just coming at you from every angle imaginable, trying to defeat, trying to derail, and trying to depress you. And when you look at the story of Job... Here's what's, here's what's almost 
almost spooky about the story of Job is that underneath everything that he lost, Satan was asking to destroy him. That's spiritual suffering. So underneath all, everything visible that we can see that's hard, underneath it is this invisible appeal from Satan to God to destroy us. So spiritual suffering is one example. Another example is relational suffering. Here's the deal. Your life is only as pleasant as your relationships are peaceful. And so if you're at war, if you have strained or severed relationships with those who are closest to you, then that's going to be a form of relational suffering. It could be betrayal. It could be bitterness, a number of things. Then there's professional and or financial suffering. You can't pay the bills. You can't get out of debt, and you hate your job, and there's no end in sight. Or there's physical suffering. You or someone you love is in a lot of physical pain. Then there's mental and emotional suffering. You're depressed, you're anxious, maybe you're grieving some form of loss. So those are the categories. And what James wants us to know about all these various sufferings is this. You can't go around it. Who would like to go around it? Just like, I'll I'll take the hall pass on pain. Give it to me if there is one, right? Uh, But you can't go around it. You got to pray through it. And that's why we want to pray, pray for you, pray for one another today, is because we know many of you are going through it. And so when these things happen, it's, it's a few things. It's painful and it's confusing. And the longer you live, the more people that you love, the more you will suffer. And you're like, that's dreary. I don't like this sermon. It, it's just how life works. It's how life works. The more people you love, uh, the more that you are going to end up suffering. And in a church our size, here's reality. Someone is always suffering. Someone is always going through a very deep, difficult experience with pain. And uh, for some, it feels like it happens all at once. You know, you go to the doctor and they're like, point to where it hurts. You're like, I don't have enough fingers for that, okay? It, hurt, it, it just hurts all over, right? So James 1.2 says, suffering comes in various kinds, not a matter of if, but when. And then in James 1.5, he also said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Why would he pair that beside suffering? Because suffering is confusing. And in the throes of suffering, you're going to need wisdom. So at the beginning, James says, we need wisdom because suffering is confusing. And at the end, James says, we need comfort because suffering is painful. How do we get both? Prayer. That's what he's telling us. So prayer, it's personal communication with the living God. But for the Christian, it's something deeper. It's something even more meaningful. It's personal communication with your loving forever present father. You see, and you're a forever father. Here's what we need to know, and this is why prayer is important. Prayer is not so much for God, it's for you. You know, I, yeah, I, I glorify God by going to him with my needs because I'm saying that he's the one who can meet them, but I'm also helping myself because I'm reminding myself I don't have all the answers and I don't have all the ability. And so you're a forever father. He knows some things that you don't. There's wisdom. You need wisdom through suffering, right? Uh, so um, our son, Elliot, is uh, he's pretty strong, and he, he gets into things he's not supposed to get into. And there's this gate at the top of our stairs, and that is intended to protect him, right? And so yesterday, I'm uh, just watching, watching Elliot, and uh, he goes to the gate like Samson strength and just starts like shaking on the gate. And I look down, at I pop his hand, I look him in the eye, I said, no, son. And in that moment, what I was doing is that lesser pain was preventing him from a greater pain that he would experience if he didn't listen to my voice and if he wasn't communicating with me. So that's that's what God will often do with us. Sometimes he'll he'll pop our hand and he'll say, the reason why I'm doing that now is so that you don't have to suffer even more later. And he will tell us, no, there's wisdom. Um, Then there's also your, your forever father will be there for you when you're down. Not just when you're confused, but also when you're down and there's comfort. If you've ever had a child or a loved one who's close to you in the hospital, you have one thing that you want to do in that moment. Be there for them. And that's, that's, what, that's what God is for us so many times in our suffering, right? He's, he's not necessarily going to change it in an instant, but he's going to be present with us through it. And more times than not, we don't need an answer through our pain. We need a companion through our pain so we can be reminded that we're not alone. And that's what our Father does for us. So our prayers, they vary in what we ask and what we need from God. And so there's, there's kind of three types of prayers that I want to give you right here if you're going through suffering. There are, first of all, Father, help me prayers. A Father, help me prayer is, Father, I need you to walk with me through this. I need you to remind me 
that you are present and you will never leave me nor forsake me because I need to go in your strength and do something very hard. How many of you, you have more confidence if you know that you're not alone, if you're not going to have to face something difficult alone? Some of you, you need, to, you need to pray, Father, help me prayers. Others of you need to pray, Father, give me hope prayers. So this is where you're moving from God be with me to God work for me. Father, this is, I can't handle this. I don't know what to do right here. I need you to act for me because I'm losing my grip on hope. So Father, give me hope prayers, and, and, and Father, go, go to battle for me. Uh, work this out prayers. And then there's others. This is probably the, the, the most desperate prayer that you could pray. Father, heal me prayers. This is where you say, God, I am totally incapable right here. I'm spent. I've lost my strength. I need a miracle. Please change me or please change this. This is where a lot of marriages end up. This is addiction. This is a, a chronic health issue that are, that's confusing the doctors. And I just want to say, if you're not a Christian, you always start with a Father, heal me prayer. Every prayer of salvation, as Romans 10, 13 says, call, um, a call upon the name of the Lord, and he, he will save you. Um, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so when you call upon the name of the Lord for salvation from your sin, and you look at the cross and you say, Jesus died because of me, so I'm guilty, but Jesus died instead of me, so there's grace. What he did somehow counted for me. And, and as Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brings me peace. And here it is. With his wounds, we are healed. So the healing of the soul, we call it salvation, is uh, a, a cry uh, on the deepest level. So which of these, I want to ask you, do you need to bring before the Father today? Do you need help? Do you need hope? Do you need healing? Whatever it is, don't leave here with a pair of socks in your hand. Leave here asking God to work and to move in that area. And whatever it is, a big part of how God will answer it is by putting other people around you. And that's why he says what he does in verse 13b. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So here's what he's saying. Some of you are suffering. Some of you are praising. Isn't it good that not everybody is suffering at the same time? It's like some of you are actually, you woke up today, you're in a pretty good mood. You're having, you're having a good day. You're having maybe a good week, maybe a good year. And it's not because life is easy. It's because you've learned to trust and walk with God well, even when things are uncomfortable. And so what do we need when we're suffering? We need godly, joyful, resilient people who praise God through pain to come around us. And here's a prayer principle whenever you need all this that we're talking about. When you pray to God, he usually answers by putting someone from the church in your life who's faced and overcome what's currently overcoming you. And so in our church, I could, I could point from the stage right now to people who have faced and overcome stuff like bitterness, betrayal, depression, divorce, anxiety, addiction, money problems, chronic health problems, the loss of a loved one, and also made it through college still following Jesus. Now, if you're in any of those places and you're like, I'm going through it, wouldn't a person like that coming beside you in that be helpful? Well, what your father wants to do and what our church wants to do is link your life with these people so you can get on the other side and help others do the same in Jesus' name. And so much of this starts with prayer. So maybe when you, you know, at the end, maybe you come forward and you pray something like, I need God to give me the courage to go and have the conversation with that person who I know has overcome what's overcoming me and ask them for help. I need the humility to go and to do that. If so, won't you come? Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? One of the most confusing verses in the New Testament. We're going to get into this. So, but it's also one of the most needed verses in the New Testament. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
All right, so what do we do about this? Well, it says, is anyone sick? Call for the elders. Now, who's an elder? Well, this can refer to someone who's just older and wiser in age, but right here, it's referring to a pastor. The word elder and pastor is interchangeable in the New Testament, and what James is saying is that sometimes someone is so sick they can't come to church that they need the church to come to them. And these are exceptional, but they're also intentional cases, but it happens in homes, it happens in hospitals. And so James says the person who goes needs to be mature in the faith, uh, an, ex- an exemplary representative of the church and the gospel, and also able to pray over you in light of what you're going through. And, you know, that we make that available in community groups. We make that available here on uh, the weekend. We're going to make it available in a special way today. And then it says anointing with oil. You're like, what is this about? Is this essential oil? Is this avocado oil? Is this beard oil? What kind of oil is this? I just want to tell you, um, don't overthink this. There's, there's nothing in and of itself that's special about the oil, but it is symbolic. It's symbolic of something that we see in the Old Testament when God sent Samuel to go and anoint King David. What he was doing is he was, he was saying he would anoint with oil from head to toe, and he, w- he would say, that is a symbol of God's power and presence filling your life. And so in the anointing with oil, what James is talking about right here, he's saying, do this. Do this for one another, and in doing so, this is communicating that God sees you, that God has set you apart, that God loves you, and that God still has good plans for you. Even though you can't see it, he's still working, and this oil is a reminder of that. And so that's all that it communicated. And at the end, if you you want that, our care team is in place and is prepared to offer that today. But don't overthink it. It's a symbol that reminds us of God's power and presence in our life in those moments when we need it. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Another tricky verse right here. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, so what is the prayer of faith? It's very simple. As Pastor J.D. Greer puts it, it's a faith-filled request for healing. That's the prayer of faith in context right here. In other words, you may not be certain of what God is going to do, but you believe that God is real, that God is good, that God is able, and that God is listening when you pray. That's the prayer of faith. So it's not, I've, I've heard some false teachers say this, that you just got to have enough faith. Well, if, if that were the case, then this dad in Mark chapter 9 who Jesus uh, goes and his son is like demon-possessed and he needs his son to be healed. And uh, Jesus looks at him and he says, do you believe? And the guy says, kind of. And then he heals his son. (laughs) And so this whole idea, you just got to have enough faith. Faith, Faith is not fulfilled because of its intensity. Faith is fulfilled because the object in which you place it is able. And so here's what we see is that what's most important with the prayer of faith is not the measure of certainty you have that God will give you exactly what you're asking for. It's the certainty that you have in God's good character. He's all wise. So when you, the prayer of faith says God is all wise, he knows what is ultimately and eternally best for you. He is all powerful. His hand is not shortened so that he can't save or won't heal. And he's ever present. He will never leave you nor forsake you because in Christ there's nothing that can separate you from him and that includes death, disease, doubt, and despair. And so this raises a question. Uh, Is this saying that God physically heals us every time we pray for healing? Well, let me me give some nuance to this. Um, There's three ways that God will heal you. First of all, God will heal you miraculously. If we had time, I could go around the room, 10 to 15 of you, would stand up and would say, God miraculously healed me when the doctors said there was no way. And the doctors were totally confused. I mean, 10 to 15, maybe even more of you could, uh, could do that. This happens sometimes. This will, this will mess with you. John chapter 5, Jesus comes to uh, the pool of Bethesda, and there's just a multitude of sick people, lame, paralyzed, invalid, and... 
he walks past a bunch of them and doesn't heal them all. But there's one who he does heal. And so out of all of those, Jesus doesn't even heal all of the people that were sick uh, miraculously in his time. Uh, But then there's also, God does do this still today. We believe that he does do this. But there's also, God will heal us medically. There's an old saying that says, there was no good old days before penicillin, anesthesia, and modern dentistry. Those, those were not good days because of the pain that was experienced. We, I mean, we take for granted antibiotics. We take for granted Tylenol. We take for granted non-invasive surgeries, outpatient care, C-sections, epidurals, chemotherapy. Thank God for those things. And God often uses them to help and to heal our bodies. But lastly, and this is the way that God will always heal the prayer of, the prayer of faith. He will heal eternally. He will heal eternally. I heard a pastor say that whenever a believer dies, it's never sad for them. They don't want to come back to us. <laughs> They're good. It's only sad for us. It's not that they are missing out anymore. It's that we are missing the void left by their absence, and that's real. And that's because all healing on this earth is temporary. You know, in John 11, what does Jesus do? Lazarus, his friend, he's been what? Dead? In a tomb? Buried? He says, Lazarus, come out! I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said that if he hadn't called Lazarus' name, he would have emptied the whole graveyard. That's the power of Jesus. But he says, Lazarus, come out! Did you know that Lazarus died again? Poor guy. It just, it just, uh, I heard an ear, no, nose, and throat doctor say that whenever I heal somebody, I feel like I'm just giving them another 10 years and delaying the inevitable. Not that it's bad, but that it's not going to last forever. Verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. All right, here's what I want to give to you from this verse. We need to be honest. We need to come clean and bring those things that, that are in the dark in our life into the light of the gospel of grace. And you have three options whenever there's something that is causing guilt. Uh, the, the Christian term for this would be conviction. Um, when you've come under conviction, um, you, can, you can do one of three things. You can celebrate sin, you can cover sin, or you can confess it. Celebrate sin is like, this is how many beers I drank, and this is how I uh, get, get by with tax evasion every year, and this is you know, how many people you, know, you slept with, and you start just celebrating sin, and you literally make a joke out of it. That's celebrating sin. You laugh at the things that makes God mourn, and you mourn over the things that make God laugh, and that's a scary sign. Um, then you can cover sin. This is what church people are really good at. Who actually wants to come out and say that they're struggling? with depression? Who actually wants to come out and say, I'm really dealing with anxiety because aren't we supposed to be people of perfect peace? Aren't we supposed to be like, you know, who actually wants to say, I'm too scared to share the gospel with my neighbor and that's why I've not done it yet? Well, so we don't want to come out and say that, but that's, that's most. It's common. And so we cover it and we pretend. Or we can confess. Here's what happens with confession. Um, guilt is to the soul what pain is to the body. It lets us know something's not, not right in here. And the remedy to the guilt in the soul, I'm not well, I need to be healed, is to confess our sins, first of all, at two steps, to God, because ultimately God forgives sins. Um, um, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to purify you from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9. So you start with God. But then you actually go to another brother or another sister who's not going to enable sinful, selfish behavior in your life, and you tell them about it. They're not going to beat you up, but they're going to build you up, and they're going to help push you forward toward godliness, away from hell and closer to heaven. Don't we need that? That, And that's what James is saying. He says that's how healing happens. And then he says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So a righteous person is not someone who's always right, but someone who's been made right by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. And so here's the attitude. God is right, and I want to side with him. So when God and I disagree, (laughs) this is humbling, he's right, I'm wrong, and I need to change. That's called repentance. 
You want to know what culture says? Culture says, God's wrong, I'm right, he needs to change, and it's reverse repentance. God needs to repent to me instead of me repenting to God. It's called self-rule. And so another word for a righteous person in Scripture is that of a saint. And so here's what I want to give you. We need to pray like saints. This is verses 17 through 18. We need to pray through suffering, pray like saints. So the saintly example we're given is the prophet Elijah. And multiple times in Revelation, saints are mentioned in the same breath as prophets like Elijah. And that's interesting because saints can just be everyday people who follow Jesus, but Elijah was this extraordinary prophet. And James addresses that. Look at verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You're like, you sure about that, James? I mean, uh, at first pass, Elijah's life and ministry seems to indicate that he was in a totally different category. This guy raised the widow's son from the dead. He, fed, he was fed by angels and birds in the wilderness. He battled King Ahab and Jezebel and the pagan prophets and put it to him. He, escort, he was escorted to heaven on a chariot of fire. He appeared and was talking with Jesus in, at his transfiguration. That's hardly a normal day in Conway. <laughs> I mean, it's just... And yet, James says Elijah was like us. So think about it this way. Elijah dealt with doubt. He dealt with depression. He dealt with discouragement. He accused God of abandoning him. Anybody prayed that prayer this week? Don't raise your hand. Okay, all right. But, but I mean, seriously, we feel that, right? Like, God, where are you? I love how author Sam Alberry puts it. James is not calling attention to the miracles of Elijah, but the prayers of Elijah. He's a compelling picture of the power of prayer, especially for people who are facing the impossible. So the significance is this. Prayer is no less powerful coming from a saint on the coast of South Carolina today than it was coming from Elijah on Mount Carmel back then. And so how do saints pray? We pray in two ways. We pray fervently and we pray faithfully. We pray fervently and we pray faithfully. Saints pray fervently. Verse 17, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And that was not because Elijah wanted famine. It's because he wanted faith. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 28 Drought was one of the unique consequences for disobedience against God. It says, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. So there's fervent. Fervent means persistent. It means you don't stop praying. And one of the patterns of Elijah's life and ministry is how he never stopped praying. Even through doubt, even through drought, he never hung up on God. And if there's one thing that, that God teaches over and over, that Jesus teaches over and over, is that some things are only going to come to us through fervent, persistent prayer. You can't ask once and just be like, it's over. All right? I, I, I firmly believe that the reason why we have a firstborn daughter is because of prayer. And let me tell you why. On March 4th, 2016, um, I just started waking up early and praying for God to give us a child. We were told that we couldn't for years. March 4th, 2016, March 5th, March 6th, March 7th, March 8th, March 4th, 2017, 365 days later, Victoria comes to me and says, we're pregnant. Have you ever prayed 365 days in a row for anything? If not, why not start today? And why not journal along the way and see what the journey looks like and how God proves faithful? And I, I understand, he doesn't always give us what we're asking for, but a lot of times he does. And that's why we're persistent. As you do, ensure that those fervent prayers are also faithful prayers. Verse 18, then he prayed again. So the first time was to stop the rain. This next time was to restore the rain. And at the time, both prayers fit God's purpose. So uh, heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. So if fervent prayers are about persistence, faithful prayers are about God's purpose. And what is God's great purpose? It's the salvation of sinners over the world across time. And how does that happen? That happens through repentance. That happens through witnessing. That happens through forgiveness. That happens through humility. That happens through disciple-making homes and churches. And so understand this. Elijah wasn't praying for rain to stop because he was tired of it being overcast. He wasn't praying for the rain to come so his flower garden would stop wilting. He prayed for rain so Israel might repent of idolatry and return to God. And so here we see this last point. There's no better way to pray God's purposes than to, number three, pray for wandering sinners. So in these last two verses, we don't read anything explicit about prayer, but we do see the result of prayer. And it's a growing burden for those who have left the truth, left the church, 
It's for those who are in need of a spiritual search and rescue mission. Take a look at verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, brings him back. So that's why we end our services saying you are sent. Go bring back the wandering. Go bring back the prodigal. Restore them to the truth and see this. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So what James is saying right here, he's showing us that the more we draw near to God in prayer, the more we will draw near to wandering prodigals. Prayer pushes us toward those who have left the church, left the truth, need to be restored. So think about it this way. If God answered every prayer of yours in the past week, tonight, in one fell swoop, how many new people would be in the kingdom of God tomorrow? How many more people would be sitting in the seat beside you next Sunday? So here's what I want to ask you. Who have you given up on? Who have you stopped praying for? Is it the child who doesn't want to go to church anymore? Is it the spouse or the parent who is completely unmoved by the things of God? Is it the roommate who's deconstructing their faith? Is it the neighbor who would rather do anything except sit through a church service like this? We want to be a church that never gives up on people. And that means we pray like saints for wandering sinners. That means everyone has one person who's far from God but close to us whose soul we're praying for Jesus to save from death. That's very different than praying for socks. And here in a few moments, some of you, you need to come forward for that person so we can pray with you and for them. And maybe some of you, you need to come forward and say, that's me and I'm coming home. And I'm trusting in Jesus. Before I invite you to come, I want to show you a picture of what can happen when we pray. Um, We can show this picture. This is a picture of a desert valley in California that, as you can tell, has not seen much rain. Most desert valleys might get a few inches of rain over the course of an entire year. This would be one of those examples. But there is a phenomenon. I don't know if you've heard of this. You can Google it. But there's a phenomenon called a super bloom. And before, before we put up this next picture, I just want to tell you what happens. So there are seeds that are lying dormant underneath the sands of this dry and dead desert. Um, And what will happen is overnight, the desert will get about a year of rain, one to two years of rain. And then the result, I want to show you this next picture. This is what happens after that rain comes. It's called a super bloom. And a super bloom, when it happens, people hear about it, and they travel from all over because it's so beautiful. Something that was once dead is now teeming with life and beauty. And I want to leave this up here, and I want to speak to your heart, and I just want to reassure you that when you will pray through suffering, well, you, you will pray like saints, and you will pray for wandering sinners. The result that we often see is a super bloom. Some of you are hurting. Some of you are going through something very hard. And if not you, you know someone who is. And you're just like, a super bloom sounds really nice right about now. That's, that's what I need. That before picture is more about like how you feel, but this is, what, this is what is produced through faith. Faith in a God who's able. Faith in a God who's good. And so um, here's the verse that I want to give you, and then I want to call our care team forward. And we're going to pray for super blooms. Um, we're not going to leave here with socks. Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Thou art coming before a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, one can never ask too much. So I want to have our care team come forward. Um, And if you would, just bow your heads, open your hearts. I'm going to give you a moment to move and respond in a moment. If you just want to come forward and kneel in prayer, Just on your own, you can do that as we sing here in a few moments. If you want to come forward and you want to be prayed for, you need help in some area, you need hope in some area, you need healing in some area, then then won't you come? Uh, If you want to be prayed over, anointed, we will do that. Um, 
Some of you, you need to come for yourself. Others of you, you need to come for someone else. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray for us. And from this prayer, we wanna turn this place into a house of prayer. We've been praying all morning that there would just be freedom. Freedom to respond. And by the way, don't be turned away too easily. When you go to the doctor and somebody's in front of you, you don't leave the office, you stay for care. If someone comes down and you gotta wait for a minute, you wait and you come. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, I know that our church has just had a hard year. Some, some here are just going through some really hard things and they feel more like that dry desert than that super bloom that's on the screen. We pray that that would change. Lord, we pray that graves would turn into gardens, that death would turn into life, and that you would minister help and hope and healing in Jesus' name, that you would make a way when it seems like there is no way for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So why don't you stand as we sing? Won't you come? Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are, we make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the dark. That is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 That is who. Yeah.
Amen. Wow. I, you can be seated. Thank you for joining us today. I, I was thinking two things as I was listening to our pastor preach. I was thinking about um, really just how big God is. And I was thinking about how little I know about how big God is. And then I was thinking many of us in here, the beauty of it being a church or we're on the front end of this where we see this vision of I can ask God for anything and I can ask him for it over and over and over and he's going to come through for me. And you're beginning to believe that. And then there are those of us who have seen God do that. I just appreciated, Pastor, the testimony of praying for a year, day by day, to have a child. What a, what a testimony. And so there's those of us on all sides of this. And so because of that, you know, what God has done, I think he's given this church just a natural propensity for thanksgiving, for gratitude. And that plays out in a lot of ways. It plays out in how hard everybody works when they come to set up and take down every Sunday. And it also plays out in our generosity. And so um, one of the things that, that we do at Coastway Church, we're a church that believes in giving. Um, we, we literally survive on the giving of, of our people. And so we're going to have on the screen a couple of ways that, that you can give if you so like. Um, one of the most popular would be giving online, coastwaychurch.com slash give. You can set up a one-time or recur recurring gift there. We have a couple of black boxes on either side of the door on the way out if you're prepared to give today, um, you know, with, with cash or, or check or whatever. And then you can mail it to the office and we have a couple of other ways to do that as well. But we just want to commend that to you as just one of the ways if God has blessed you and if God has come th through for you, whether it be some, some of you have heard say this church was the answer to my prayer. This church was God coming through for me. If God, if you have that sort of testimony or if you believe in what you've heard today and what you see out of Coastway, uh, we want to commend that to you as a way to show gratitude to the Lord. And we also want to commit to you our desire to be totally faithful with the gifts that, that God's people bring. And so we thank you for that. Um, again, we look forward to what God's going to do. And we hope that you are going to have a great week this week. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. So with that, Coastway Church, you are sent. <laughs>